Welcome, Stuart. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm excited for our conversation today. Thanks for taking the time. Yeah, well, thanks for having me. I, uh, I looked over the list of uh, the people you normally have, and I listened to a couple of podcasts, and I think this might be boring for your listeners because it's, you usually have more like inspirational kind of people and things like that. And I'm a, I'm kind of a nuts and bolts kind of guy, you know, but, uh, but, uh, but anyway, hopefully someone out there will find something interesting here. So. No, definitely. I mean, I think, uh, the nuts and bolts are sometimes what's important to get into. So, um, you know, uh, I just follow my interests when it comes to the podcast. So there's no specific real topic. So, uh, that's not a, not a problem at all, but why don't we just jump straight into it? Uh, wh well, first of all, could you, if you don't mind, give a little bit of a background of, of who you are and, and where you came from and how you ended up in, in Belize. So uh, that's always an interesting thing. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm a U.S. tax attorney and I specialize in international tax and I do that basically both ways, meaning that I help Americans who live outside the U.S. or are investing outside the U.S. And then also I help non-Americans who are, you know, doing something within the U.S. And I started out in life uh, at big law firms. And the last, uh, uh, before moving to Belize, I was in Chicago. And so, you know, it's... Uh, I had two young kids and I, I basically didn't get to see them at all during the week. And, you know, for, for half the year, which is wintertime in Chicago, like it was a uh, pretty terrible, you know, leaving the house when it's dark and coming home when it's dark. And, and so eventually figured out that there might be more to life than that. And, and, uh, and then we decided to move back to where my wife is from, because this, this is where we have the most family. It, uh, uh, my, my side of the family is kind of more scattered. And so, so yeah, it's, I, I'm really glad my wife is from Belize because I, I do lo love living in, in Belize, but really it was a move towards her family. So if she was from, you know, Ohio or something, I guess I'd be living in Ohio right now, but, uh, but, and I'm sure Ohio is lovely. So, you know, no, uh, you know, not trying to say anything bad about <laughs> anyone there, but, uh, but yeah, so, so yeah, so life is, uh, life is good. Great. Beautiful. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, my family's from Central America, from Panama and from El Salvador and, uh, Belize is always just like sort of its own sort of thing. You know, Central America in and of itself, I, I think, is definitely its own little thing. Like Mexico's apart from us, and then South America's is all other thing as well, and the Caribbean. But I don't know. As Central America, since it's not a Spanish speaking country, like in our yeah. heads, maybe it's just on, you know, like we don't think about it that much. But, but I've heard, I've heard good things. So. <laughs> Yeah, when I met my wife in law school, she said she was from Belize. I, I, I literally, at that point, I had no idea where in the world Belize was. I mean, it could have been in Africa or like on the moon or something. I had literally no idea, but uh, but I uh, figured it out. So, yeah, it's it's interesting. It's it's a uh, it's kind of like a mainland island because it, it's culturally it's more like uh you know one of the the chain of islands in the Eastern Caribbean or something because it used to be the United Kingdom and then I mean uh and then got independence in 1981. So. So yeah, it's like in mainland Central America, but it's it's culturally it's more like it's it's more like uh you know Jamaica or the Cayman Islands or something like that, like a U.S. or U.K. Virgin Islands or something like that. Interesting. Yeah. Okay, fair enough. And so, how did you end up as a well? Obviously, you, I'm assuming you started as a tax lawyer stateside, right? Um, and yep. how did you end up doing what you're doing now? And was it something that you realized uh, you you could benefit from as well. And then that's sort of what led you down the path or, or how did you end up here? Yeah. Uh, sort of a, you know, circuitous serendipitous path, I, I guess, in that we really decided to make the move to Belize, but before I really knew exactly what I was going to do here. And, mm -hmm. you know, what I told people at the time was I, I may, I, uh, you know, since I'm a lawyer, I may join the bar in Belize or I may just buy a bar in Belize. You know, I, I, I kind of had, had no <laughs> idea. And then, uh, and then I was just kind of looking around on the internet, you know, for international tax, uh, just kind of looking at how other people are, are, are doing that. And, and it's funny cause I found this website of this guy whose name I will not mention, but I, this website looked really cool, you know, and I, I was like, oh, and he's doing all this like cool international stuff. And I, and I was like, you know what? I don't know if I can really put myself out there like that because I was always kind of more of a back office kind of guy, you know, like, I, I don't know if I could put myself in front of the public as in like get clients and like that. And, and I was like, oh, this guy's so cool. And so then, then I figured out, well, 
I can do that, you know? So, so I started doing it. I eventually met that guy and learned that he's, he was disbarred and went to jail. Uh, and, <laughs> and so okay. anyway, so there's a lot of, a lot of, uh, interesting characters around like the international tax space. And so that, that's one way I kind of differentiate, differentiate myself, I think, is that like, first of all, I'm an actual lawyer because a lot of people talk about international tax just because they do something international. Um, and you know, they don't have any actual, uh, tax training or experience and, mm. uh, yeah. So anyway, it, uh, it's been, it's been really great. I, I always wanted to start my own thing. You know, I always wanted to kind of have my own, uh, my own kind of business going on, but I, I thought the way I was going to do that is within a, the large law firms that I, I used to, I used to work at. I thought I would kind of have my own clients and do, do my own thing that way. But, but, uh, but now I'm just really glad that life has worked out the way it has because I'm just like really independent, you know, so it's, it's nice. Beautiful, beautiful, yeah. Yeah, you really oftentimes don't know where life's going to take you. It's sometimes easier to just let it uh, come to you rather than you try and chase the exact solution. So yeah, absolutely. that's great. But uh, before we get into the nitty gritty, uh, the first question that's possibly a little bit more technical is why should someone want to live abroad, right? I mean, often I... When I mention that I do want to live abroad, run my business abroad, people are like, oh, what are you, what are you talking about? Uh, the U.S. is the best place in the world to do business. And my reaction usually is, well, I can run it, right? I can run it remotely. It could still be a U.S. company. Uh, but I'm curious to see your take on the, the benefits and why somebody should consider living abroad as an expat or as a digital nomad, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, you know... Uh... I definitely think that, you know, different strokes are different folks. If someone doesn't want to live outside the U S well, I, you know, I, 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 I certainly enjoyed it and I'm, and I'm glad I, I'm glad I do uh, live outside the U S but, but if someone's happy in the U S well, that's fine with me. And, you know, uh, you know, but I, you know, it, it, I remember the first time, so I, I grew up in Oklahoma, you know, and then like, I, uh, I, uh, thought that there might be more to life than, than Oklahoma. And so, uh, when looking at colleges, I made it all the way to Texas, you know, so not, not very far, but, um, and so, um, so I hadn't really seen that much of the world. And I, I remember the very first time that I, I got back to Texas after visiting Belize uh, in law school, after my wife and I started dating and, and you can kind of feel your feet on the globe, you know, so it's, it's sort of a different experience to have spent some time outside outside the U.S. And, and, and it, it, it's even different really than I think than like going to another state because you really feel like, uh, you know, your place in the world, I guess, a little bit, you know. So, so anyway, so I guess there's probably some enriching uh, aspects to, to traveling. But if someone isn't interested in doing that, well, well, don't, you know, I, I think that's fine. But I guess to get into the tax stuff, you know, there are some good tax reasons uh, to think about at least uh, living outside the U S when you're, especially when you're young and, and you're, and you're, you're working. So, uh, so the gen the general rule is that U S citizens and green card holders are subject to U S tax on our worldwide income. So, so no matter where you live, you know, just living outside the U S by itself, that doesn't mean that you're not subject to U S tax anymore. Okay. So this is different. Uh, you know, uh, like, Canadians, for example, they can leave Canada and then they can uh, file some paperwork uh, with the Canadian tax authority and like do, you know, close down their Canadian stuff. And then they're basically done with Canadian tax. But with the U.S., it doesn't work that way. You would have to renounce your U.S. citizenship in order to just be done with with U.S. tax. Um, so uh, so so. Not everything changes whenever you leave the U.S., but there are some things that that do change. And the main uh, special rule that young working people can use to to save on U.S. tax when they're outside the U.S. is something called the Foreign Earned Income Exclusion, or the FEIE for for short. And what that basically is is a deduction of about one hundred and twenty thousand dollars per year. Uh, and it only works for income from working, uh, but that, that working can be having a job for a U.S. company, having a job for a non-U.S. company, 
uh, working for yourself as a freelancer, uh, or, or like, you know, working for your own company, uh, that you own as well. Um, and, and I say it's about $120,000 because it, it, the number is tied to inflation. So it was exactly 120,000 in 2023. And then now it's 126,500 in 2024. So it'll, it'll go up a little bit each year. And, um, so yeah, so if, if you're, you know, if you just graduated college and you, and you have your first job and you're making less than that, uh, and you leave the U S then you would pay zero U S federal income tax as long as you qualify. Now, the, the basic way to qualify, uh, if you're going to be a digital nomad is to spend less than 35 days in the U S per year. Okay. So that's something called the physical presence test. Um, so spend less than 35 days in the U S per year. And that, that's the easy way to think about it. Like on a planning kind of basis, mm -hmm. how it actually works is more complicated than that. Cause it doesn't work on a calendar year basis. It works on a rolling 12 month period basis. And so like, if, if you're, you know, if it's June 1st and you, and you jump on an airplane and go to Southeast Asia, uh, well, you can start using the foreign earned income exclusion from June 1st of this year until May 31st of, of next year. So, um, so you can start using it at any, any time, uh, you want to, but, but yeah, I mean, you just look at however much U S federal income tax you're paying and, and, um, and you know, you can turn that number to zero if you make less than a hundred, about $120,000 a year. And you, you don't mind, you know, only spending 35 days a year in, in the U S and so basically the, the U S federal government will pay you to travel around Southeast Asia and South America and Central America and wherever else you want to go, you know? So that's, uh, and, and like the, the U S federal income tax on $120,000 is like about $25,000. And so with, with $25,000, you can buy a lot of plane tickets and Airbnb, uh, nights and things like that. And so when you say, if I went to Southeast Asia on June 1st, you're saying that if I were to spend three months out of the year in Southeast Asia, those three months I could then write off or not write off, write deduct rather. No. Okay. So, so to, to get your foot in the door with the foreign earned income exclusion, you have to pass either the physical presence test or the bona fide residence test, the bona fide residence test. That's for people like me who just live in, you know, outside the U S and, and they have a house and two, two kids and two dogs. And just like, you know, I just, I just live in Belize. Right. Um, so if you're going to nomad around, you're not going to qualify as a bona fide resident of any, any, uh, place. So you have to use the physical presence test. And so, so how the physical presence test works is, uh, you have to be, uh, okay. Let me say it the very technical way. Uh, <laughs> if you pass the physical presence test, uh, there must be a 12 month period during which you are outside the United States for at least 330 full days. Okay. So, so normally people think about it the other way, instead of saying be outside the U S for at least 330 full days, people think of it as you can only spend 35 days in the U S. Okay. And, and it works on a rolling 12 month period basis. So, so like the easiest way to think about it, like if, if you're going to be a digital nomad for a bunch of years, you know, and you're just kind of planning in the abstract, uh, and like, if you're thinking about like 2025, well, okay. For 2020, for the calendar year, 2025, spend less than 35 days in the U S and then you pass the physical presence test. But, uh, but the, the only time you need to get that rolling 12 month period thing in your brain is like, if, if, uh, you know, if you're, if you're like, all right, it's June 1st, I'm going today, you know? And so obviously if you spent the first part of the year in the U S well, then, then that year you can't spend less than 35 days in the U S during that calendar year. But if, if you spend less than 35 days in the U S during the 12 month period that starts on June 1st, whenever you leave, well, then you, then you still, you qualify for the, the foreign earned income exclusion and you can, you can therefore exclude your income, uh, for the last half of the year, basically. Mm. I see. So does you can do, it does, it does. So you can do, I suppose for your, say you started June, 2022, you can take advantage of the, of the foreign in, earned income exclusion if for the remainder of those six years, but then six months. And, but then you would need to also be out of the country or at least less than 35 days for the 2023, the first six months of 2023. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like okay. the, the way I think about it to like visualize it um, mm -hmm. is imagine like a horizontal line, like a number line or something and like make up like each each month is like a block and then put in like three years on that on that horizontal line, you know, and then and then above the line, imagine like a bracket or something like uh, and, and that bracket is exactly 12 months long. Right. So if you put the left part of the bracket on like January 1st of like the second year, it'll go to. December 31st of the, of the second year. Right. Okay. So now what you're doing is like sliding that bracket around and, and you're saying, can, can I put this bracket somewhere mm -hmm. so that underneath it, there's only 35 days in the U S. So that's the way to think about it. If you're kind of coming and going and, and, you know, you're having this kind of in the U S sometimes and outside the U S sometimes and doing this sort of complicated thing you know, that, that's the way to see if you, if you ever passed the physical presence test. It seems to me that it'd be much easier to just assure that you're out of the U S as much as possible. I mean, obviously there's the specific details that you're saying, right. But I could definitely see people, um, getting stressed out about, okay, how many days have I exactly spent in the U S uh, I need to yeah. be, you know, I need to be careful or, uh, like this whole process seems to be a lot easier if you just live abroad, right? As in full time. Yep, yep exactly, so. exactly. And there are some detailed rules here because we're talking about tax. So of course there's gotta be complicated crap going on, you know, but like, uh, like I mentioned, you have to, uh, and actually I, th I said it a little bit wrong earlier. Okay. So, uh, the, the, the most technical way to say the physical presence test is that, uh, in, in, in some 12 month period, you must spend at least 330 full days in another country. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, so the full days concept, that means that if you travel to the U S or you travel from the U S then that's treated as a day in the U S. Okay. And then the, in another country thing is like for, like, I like to sail. And so if you happen to be like a sailor or like an astronaut or something, well, you might spend time outside the United States and not within any other country. And, and for some weird reason that I don't think makes an entire amount, a uh, whole lot of sense, uh, those days are kind of treated as days in the U.S. So if you're on Mars, then you're in the U.S. for purposes of this test. You know, it's kind of strange. So mm -hmm. but anyway. No, definitely. That's. Yeah. So the way I kind of think about bizarre, this. It's bizarre, but that's tax. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know. But if you're, if you're young and you don't have anything, you know, you don't have kids tiny down yet and, and you want to see the world, then it's, it's basically, it's like Uncle Sam will pay, uh, you know, will pay you to see the world, you know? And so like you can, um, you know, and, and, and it's kind of a, you know, um, you know, it's a kind of a fun thing to do anyway. Um, mm -hmm. now, now a couple other things, um, the, the foreign earned income exclusion only works for purposes of U.S. federal income tax. Whenever you have a job working for a U.S. company, there's this whole other set of taxes you got to pay that are called em employment taxes. And so those are the ones that you see on your W-2 that's like FICA and FUTA and hospital tax. So you still got to pay those taxes. You can't get out of employment taxes. And then also, if you're, if you're self-employed, like you're a freelancer, you're doing your own thing, then um, you have to pay self-employment tax, which is basically both sides of employment taxes. Because with, with employment taxes, uh, your employer pays half of it and then you pay half of it. So with self-employment tax, you pay both sides of, of the employment taxes. And so that's about 15% of the first about $160,000. So, so even on, so, so if you're like a freelancer um, or, you know, you have your own thing, then on the first 100, about $120,000, you will still pay about 15% uh, tax, even if you qualify for the foreign earned income exclusion, because you'll be paying self-employment tax. And I've heard you say several times that there's no way of getting out of that, right? Yeah, exactly. Like if, uh, it, you know, if, well, okay. So this gets to like the, the next level of, of stuff to think about, like uh, the, the next level of complication is like what legal structure to put around what you do. Okay. And, and here's where I draw a distinction between what I call a profession and then what I call a business. And these two things are not technical tax terms. They're just kind of my way of making sense of, of the world and, and of how tax works. Um, so 
I use the word profession to refer to someone, uh, to like the activity of selling your own services. Okay. So for example, I'm a tax lawyer. People book consultations with me. People, you know, uh, pay me for advice and stuff in other ways. And so I sell my services. So that is a profession. Um, and, and so then the other, the other way to make money is to have a, what I call a business, which is where you sell anything else in the entire world other than your own services. So for example, if you sell stuff on Amazon, FBA, uh, well, that's a business. If you sell online courses, that's a business. If you sell services of a team of people, well, that's a business too. Like if you have a marketing agency and you have a bunch of people that work there, well, that's a, that's a business because you're not just selling your own services. So, so what you were getting at a second ago there is that whenever what you are doing is a profession, then, uh, the only legitimate way to do that, uh, from a U.S. tax perspective is, uh, as an individual, or if you want to have some kind of legal structure around it, you can do that, but it would have to be like, uh, a Wyoming LLC, for example, in which you are the sole member. And, and so it, when that's the case, the LLC is called a disregarded entity for U.S. tax purposes. So the LLC simply doesn't exist. And so for U.S. tax purposes, you are just an individual who is selling their own services. Um, so it does not work to, to like run a profession through, uh, uh you know, any other type of legal entity. Uh, but, but if you have a business, then you do have the opportunity to, uh, to run that business through a non U S corporation. And, and there are some other benefits to that. The, the, the main benefit is that it gets you out of self-employment tax because if you, uh, you know, the, the the hook for self-employment tax is that you're self-employed, meaning that you're working for yourself, right? Well, if you, if you have a business and you do the, and you run that business through a non-U.S. corporation, well, then you're not working for yourself. You have a job working for a non-U.S. corporation. Okay. It's sort of weird because you also own a hundred percent of the non-U.S. corporation, right? But still, uh, for tax purposes, that non-U.S. corporation is a separate person and you work for it, even though you also own it, you know? So, so it is kind of strange, but it's different. And so, um, so that, you know, does get you out of self-employment taxes, you know, having a business versus, versus a profession. And so, uh, you know, so sometimes what people, once they learn about this stuff, what they think of doing is, well, if they have a profession, is there a way to convert that into a business? So then that, that then they can use a non-U.S. corporation. So like if you're selling your own web de design services, well, what about hiring some people and, you know, ramping up and. Now you're selling services of a team of people, or what about also selling some like online courses, uh, around what you do or something, you know, or having like a membership group or, or, or something like that. So, uh, yeah. So when you set up this structure, I'm assuming you become a tax resident in a different country, or it, I guess it de would depend on that. I have had many people, um, I've, I've gotten everything from, you know, I'm, I'm no longer a tax resident in my country, so I'm not a tax resident anywhere to, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a tax resident here and I pay zero taxes here and pay zero taxes in the U.S. You know, I've got varying um, answers to that. So, yeah, well, okay. So, so the place to start here is that, you know, you have to look at the laws of, 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 of every country, right? So that, I mean, that's, that's the basic uh, exercise here is okay. Make a list. We got about 200 countries. Uh, look at your, look at the law of that country and your facts and determine if you are a tax resident of that country. Right. So, uh, for, for, for almost every country, that would be a very easy exercise. Like I've never been to Kazakhstan. I don't know anybody in Kazakhstan, you know, so like I am very, very confident that I'm not a tax resident of, of Kazakhstan. Right. So, uh, but, uh, but like, uh, in general, the rule of thumb, is, is something like, you know, if you spend more than six months per year in a country, then you'll be a tax resident of that country. Okay. But, but here's the more difficult part. Okay. So he, here's sort of like the, the gray area of the digital nomad lifestyle. So, 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 so let's say you get a, uh, uh, a tourist visa to enter a country, right? So let's say you decide to go to France. Um, well, as an American, you don't have to apply ahead of time for a tourist visa. They, they'll just let you in, right? So, as, but, but as, as soon as you land, 
they stamp your passport and they, they'll give you like 90 days or 180 days. And that's, that's the tourist visa to visit France. Well, when you have a tourist visa in France, you're supposed to be like, you know, eating a bunch of cheese and like looking at paintings and, and stuff like that. Right. You're not supposed Spending to money. be like, yeah, exactly. You're not supposed to be opening up your laptop and working, like running your business or, or doing your profession or having a job uh, for a U.S. company or, or something like that. So, so if you do that, if you, if you go to France and you work while you're in France, technically you are in immigration trouble in France. Okay. You have violated the terms of your visa in France. Um, and then the second thing is the tax law of France is going to say something like, if you work while you're in France, you got to pay French tax. Okay. So, um, I'll give you a guess as to like how many, you know, non-French people actually do, you know, file a, yeah, file a French tax return. And, and, uh, it, it's exactly like, there's probably one guy, you know, there's, there's probably one guy who's just like, oh, I feel so bad. And then he files a return. <laughs> But anyway, uh, but yeah, it, but, but the thing is, is like the jails of France are not full of Americans and Australians and, and, you know, Brits and whatever, um, who, who have, you know, violated their tourist visa instead, like the beaches and the, the Airbnbs of France are full of those people. Right. So, uh, and, and France doesn't really care because you're spending money, you're, you're paying value added tax every time you buy something. And so they don't really care. They're, 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 you know, you're a net, you know, positive to to France. So, but anyway, so that, that is, that's the thing that squares the circle here. Cause you know, people, a lot of times people have this idea like, well, wait a minute, why, how come I can be outside the U S and not be paying tax outside the U S and the answer is, well, because you're supposed to, but you just don't, you know? And so, um, so yeah, so, so generally, yeah. Um, the, the, the standard like digital nomad lifestyle involves not becoming a tax resident of any other jurisdiction by not spending more than six months a year in any country um, uh, and ignoring the fact that you probably do owe tax in whatever country you're in uh, because you are, uh, uh, you are actually working there. Yeah. And to be clear, as a U.S. citizen, you're a tax resident in the U.S. And so when you do go abroad, there's a little... I feel there's less um, uncertainty for you, right? And I think I've heard you say this before, where there's, it's an actual advantage that you know, because you, correct me if I'm wrong, you can't be, at least for, for obviously for citizenship reasons, you can't be stateless, but for, for taxation purposes, you also can't be stateless, right? So as a U.S. citizen abroad, you, you know at least you always have your tax residency in the U.S., and that can be, from, I guess, from your perspective, an advantage? Yeah, That's yeah, it's, it's sort question. of a, it is sort of a double-edged sword thing because like, right. like back to the Canadian we were talking about before. Um, so so if, a, if a Canadian jumps on an airplane and, and decides to go tromping around Southeast Asia uh, for a couple of years, um, well, they're going to want to lose their tax residence in Canada. But, it, it, you know, obviously I don't know the rules there all that well. I didn't go to law school in, in Canada, but in general, I believe that uh, to to no longer be a tax resident of Canada, you have to be a tax resident somewhere else, you know. And so, if if you go straight from tax resident of Canada to tromping around Southeast Asia, then you're probably still a tax resident of Canada. And and I think people do various paperwork sort of things to to make it look like they're a tax resident somewhere else, even though they're not, you know. And so so that's where there's a bunch of uncertainty and sort of like a, a cloud over their head, right? Um, and so with the with, you know, with being an American, it's like, well, there's, there's, you know, it's sort of bad in that you're still subject to U.S. tax. But if you're, if you're young and, and all your income is from working, and especially if you're making less than $120,000 a year, well, just qualify for the foreign earned income exclusion. And then um, even though you're still subject to the U.S. tax, you don't have to actually pay any U.S. federal income tax, you know, so. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, I, I, the reason I ask is, because there's usually at least, you know, in the circles of offshore taxes, right? There's usually just like a definitive hatred of, of the fact that, you know, as U.S. citizens, we were taxed all over the world. Um, so I just wanted to bring that there's at least one positive uh, yeah, yeah, right, exactly. aspect to it. So, Yeah, and one, just a, 
I, I mentioned the idea a minute ago of, of using a non-US corporation. And so just to say a little bit more about that, it, like we have touched only like the, the snow on the very tippy top of the iceberg here, right? So there, there's a lot more to talk about. And, and you know, and this is where like, I get a little bit annoyed at some of the kind of the kinds of people I mentioned earlier, I call them offshore gurus who are mm -hmm. people who like sell non-US corporations for a living, but you know, they're not burdened by actually being tax attorneys. And so they don't know how it really works. And so they just go, oh yeah, use a non-US corporation, you know, so they, they know probably only what we've said so far and maybe not even that, you know, but so there's a lot more to it and it depends on just the particular facts of each situation. And so just as in a couple of examples, like if you have a business where you have a partner in the U S and the partner is working for you or, or like working in the business as well, uh, well then a non U S corporation is not going to work. Similarly, if you have employees in the U S and non U S corporation is not going to work. If, if you've already started the business and it's making a whole lot of money, it's very valuable. Then there are some issues with having a non U.S. corporation. If you want to sell the business in the near term, there are also some issues with having a non U.S. corporation. So, so basically there's a lot to it. And, um, it's, it's kind of one of those, like, uh, you know, you, you need to talk to someone to, to go through your exact mm -hmm. situation and, uh, see if it, if it's really a good idea or not. It, it's not just a one size fits all sort of thing. So when you say that the difficulty is with selling, um, from the structure that I've under, that I understand from you is you have your LLC in the U S and your non U S uh, corporation, whether it be an IBC or something else, um, could you not just sell the LLC and then those funds you, and essentially the offshore corporation is receiving those funds and then from there on everything's offshore uh the sale yeah, yeah. So, would essentially be the LLC, the sale of the llc not of the offshore company right yeah yeah okay so earlier you told me that you listen to my podcast and whenever people tell me that uh first of all i think well okay that's great because they have some background in this stuff but second the last podcast episode I did was in 2017, before mm -hmm. the passage of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017, which is in on mm. December 21st of, of 2017. Okay, so there were some big changes there, and I got a little busy, and then life happened, and then here we are in 2024, and I still haven't like updated the podcast, but I really, 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 really need to do another podcast episode. Maybe I can like link, maybe I, maybe use this one or something. I don't know. <laughs> Or something, but yeah, I really, I really need to update it. Okay. So, um, so, uh, what I discussed in the podcast is that, uh, like the, the non U S corporation itself is not subject to U S tax. And then as long as you leave money in the non U S corporation, you don't have to pay U S tax on that. Okay. Well, the, the tax cuts and jobs act of 2017 created this new set of rules called the gu guilty rules. And guilty is G I L T I. It stands for global intangible low taxed income. And, and basically none of those words make any sense. Really? I guess maybe income makes sense. Uh, maybe global. I don't know. Um, but, uh, they, they just wanted the acronym guilty, you know, and, and, uh, right. okay. So how the guilty rules generally work is that the, the net income of a non U S corporation flows through the corporation to the American owner of, of the company. Okay. So, um, okay. So quick example, let's say, let's say you live outside the U S full time, you own an Amazon FBA business through a, the structure that you mentioned with like, you know, where you own a Belize company, the Belize company owns a Wyoming LLC. Um, and, uh, and let's say that the business makes $250,000, uh, in a year of net income. And then let's say it pays you a salary of a hundred thousand dollars. Okay. Um, okay. Bef uh, in, in like 2016, and then going back to like the beginning of time, how, how tax worked was that, uh, your income is $0. Um, and so you pay no tax this year. Okay. Well, starting in 2018 under the guilty rules, the, uh, you know, you get the hundred thousand dollars as a salary. And as long as you qualify for the foreign earned income exclusion, you pay zero tax on that. 
but the $150,000 of, of net income at the company level above your salary, that flows through the company th this year, the, in the current year, you know, and, and you have to pay U.S. tax on that $150,000, okay? And then finally, here's the final piece to bring it all the way back around to what you just said about the sale. Um, that $150,000 is, is ordinary income. Okay. It's all a guilt, guilty is mm. always ordinary income. It's not, it's not capital gain. Okay. So let's say that you have an Amazon FBA business and, uh, and, and, the, and you sell the business. Well, how businesses are generally sold, uh, these types of businesses are generally sold is that you, you would sell the Amazon account. So for tax purposes, basically we would have the non U S corporation selling an Amazon account. And so, so the net income would turn into guilty and flow through the company and land on your return as ordinary income. But if you didn't have a non-U.S. corporation, if you just owned it through like an S corporation in the U.S. Uh, or just like an LLC that's a disregarded entity, then you would have long-term capital gain on your, on your tax return, which, which, you know, the tax rate on that is like about half of the tax rate of, of ordinary income, depending on the amount, right? Um, and so, so anyway, so that's, so that's why it's one of the considerations uh, of like, are you ever going to sell this business? So it might not be a good idea, but you know, um, it, it can be like a crystal ball kind of exercise where, you know, you, you want to be fairly accurate and precise about, uh, what life is going to look like in the next few years. And then it, it also becomes sort sort of a you pay your money and you take your chance to sort of thing where like you say, I'm never going to sell this business. I love this business. I run the business. That's what I do. Um, and so then you, you put, you, you know, you put it into the best legal structure for that situation. But then, then the next year, someone comes along and says, I like your business too. How about I give you a pile of cash for it? And you go, Oh, well, um, so, so anyway, so yeah, there's, there's some, uh, you know, life is complicated is the short way to express it, I guess. Right. Cool. So essentially, your offshore company has now become a flow through entity with these new, with the new guilty rules. Yeah, exactly. That's what it to like me. if you're, if, if, if you're familiar with an S corporation in the U S it, mm -hmm. a non U S corporation essentially works like an S corporation. And of course there are nuances because everything's got to be complicated with tax. Uh, so like, uh, to, to the extent of a 10% return on the depreciable asset base of the non U S company it still works like it did before 2018. Okay. So, but depending on what kind of business you have, the, the depreciable asset base may be $0 or like the value of one laptop or, or something, right. Mm -hmm. uh, it may not be very much. So, um, so yeah. Okay. So and now that's, and that, that, that's the case. Oh, sorry. I, just to round this out, like that's the case when, uh, the company is a controlled foreign corporation, meaning it's, it's, a it's more than 50% owned by U.S. persons. And so, so the model here I was talking about is like one, one American dude owns, or dude, I guess, owns 100% of a non-U.S. corporation, right? Now, if, if you happen to have a non-U.S. business partner and you're 50-50 partners, well, then you're, you, don't, you don't have to deal with a guilty rule. So you can leave money in the company. The company can invest it. And then you can get a dividend from the company 20 years from now having you know, enjoyed the compound return on the pre-tax dollars mm -hmm. that whole time, you know, um, another, another way to think about it is, uh, if you're married, uh, and your, and your spouse happens to be, uh, you know, not an American, well, then your spouse can own half the company and you own half the company, you know? So, um, yeah, I, I, I talk to people about this who are like, like, you know, when people are like in like entrepreneurial circles and stuff, like, if you go to another country to like a conference or something and, and you're kind of wanting a partner anyway, and, and you're thinking about starting a new business, you know, well go, you know, go talk to the people who, who have a different accent than you whenever they speak English right? and, and, uh, and talk to them and try to find, try to get one of them as your partner. And then if you live outside the U S then you can have this tax benefit, but you're kind of, you are kind of married to that person because the, you, you would need to agree on keeping the money in the company and what the company does with the money and, you know, things like that. So. Mm -hmm. Um, so there definitely is, uh, a lot to think about way more than just tax, but, uh, you know, that's at least an idea. So, and you could in the future have a draw is what you're saying. And like, or how would that, how would you then receive the money if you did have a, a 50, 50 partnership, uh, situation with a non-US? Yeah, well, so 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the company being 50% owned by a a non-American, the benefit of that is that you get to delay the payment of U.S. tax until the money comes out of the company. And so that's the only benefit. So it allows you to, so like, let's say, let's say, you you know, as an example, let's say the company has a hundred dollars of, of net income above, above the salaries that go out to, to you Mm -hmm. and, and your partner. Well, if, if you're a U.S. citizen and, and you own 100% of that company, you don't get to invest $100. You get to invest the after-tax amount of $100, whatever that turns out to be, $80, $75, depending on how much you know, tax you got to pay. Um, but if you have a non-U.S. partner, then you get to invest $100 by, by leaving it in the company. Now, one of these days, that, that $100 is going to come out of the company, and you'll pay tax at that point, on, on, not only on the $100, but on the you know, on the, all the, on the $25 that that hundred dollars made by and you investing it, you know? Um, but you know, if you do a time value of money, uh, analysis, then, you know, you'll see the benefit of, of, of getting to invest the, the initial amount as opposed to paying it in tax at that point. Mm-hmm. So and also if it's a 50% is... partner is your spouse, then it's an even better benefit because it's, it's like, um, you know, it's kind of all coming out in your direction anyway, but half of it escapes tax uh, mm-hmm. in the U.S. So, so that's, so that's nice. Here. So the consensus is it's a very personal situation. Like every situation is different and you really need somebody that, that knows, uh, knows this well. Yep. Absolutely. Lots of, lots of ins, lots of outs, mm-hmm. uh, lots of, lots of complications. So, yep. Okay. Mm. So a question I have is, um, can you take an existing business and then create this structure or would you need to start from scratch? Um, a lot of people sometimes have told me, oh, you know, wait till you get to X amount of income and then do this idea that you have of using an offshore company, you know, and it, and I often say, I think when you really need tax savings is when you're building up a, a company. It's when you, when you have the most benefit. Um, and obviously, you know, income tax is income tax, but from a corporate or corporation standpoint, it could be beneficial. Am I correct? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, so if whatever you contribute an appreciated asset to a non-US corporation, you have sold that asset for tax purposes, okay? This is kind of counterintuitive for, for a lot of people. You know, like let, let's say you own some Microsoft stock, you know, through your E-Trade account. And then, and then let's say you hit the sell button uh, and you sell the stock. And so now you have cash in, in your E-Trade account. Well, you know you're paying tax if you had a game because that feels like, that feels, I mean, that's just, you know, that's, you, you sold ta- stock at a gain. Of course you pay tax, right? But the, the reason you've got to pay tax is not because you sold something for cash. The reason is that you traded one thing for another thing. It's just the, here the other thing happens to be cash. But, but, uh, but let's say you own like Bitcoin and, and you trade that Bitcoin for an equivalent value of Ethereum. Well, you have sold that Bitcoin and that's a taxable transaction. And so, so it's the same thing here. If, if you own a, an Amazon FBA business and like, and like you own it through a disregarded LLC. So like you, for tax purposes, you own the business yourself, and then you contribute that business to a non-US corporation, you have sold that business for, for tax purposes. And so you have to come up with a number that is the fair market value of the business and, um, and you're paying tax on that. Now, um, the weird kind of thing here is that um, in general, the, the long-term capital gain tax rate is 15%. And then the self-employment tax rate is also about 15%. And so, um, so it, it, it can be kind of easy to calculate the pay to play aspect here, where it's kind of like whatever multiple you put on the net income of the business to arrive at its value that's how long it takes to reap the benefits of the non-U.S. company structure. Hmm. Okay. You see what I'm saying? It's a little bit complicated, but, but, uh, but anyway, that's, that's kind of one way to, that's kind of one way to think about it, but different businesses are different. Sometimes, you know, uh, 
you might be able to take a good position on what the value of the business is. Like if, if, if the business is sort of like wrapped up in you personally, you know, where like, it's sort of a, like, let's say you're a life coach or something and you know, your website is like first name, last name.com or whatever, and you have a membership group or something. Well, you can't really sell that business, right? I mean, I, I can't buy that business from that person and be like, oh, I'm, I'm the life coach now. You know, they'd be like the people in the group, they'd be like, what the hell are you talking about? You know? And so, uh, so, so, you know, so some businesses, uh, even though they make money, uh, if you look at it on a dead basis, like what would someone pay for this? The answer might be not a whole lot, you know? Um, and so, so this kind of gets to the, you know, where different businesses are different, but yeah, I mean, yeah, it's kind of funny because like, uh, you know, my, my, my ideal person to talk to is someone who is like 23 years old. They're, they're just about to leave the U S for the first time. And they're just about to start a, a Amazon FBA business, something like that. Right. Like whenever someone like that books a call with me, I'm like, all right, this is great. Let me tell you how to set it up and life is good. And oh, also they, they don't have any employees in the U S they don't have any plans to sell it soon. Yada, yada, yada. So, uh, but anyway, so, you know, always ins and outs, but, uh, but yeah, so the, the worst is like, you know, the worst is like someone is like 50 years old. They, they make a billion dollars a year. Um, they, they've owned the business for 47 years and it, and, uh, and then they want to leave the U S and put it in a non U S corporation. I'm like, no, that's not gonna, you know, you know, you're going to pay a bunch of tax. And so, you know, so, yeah. So what, maybe this is the wrong question, but what companies lend themselves well to these structures from a standpoint of, okay, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm about to start a company. Uh, what companies, you know, obviously you're saying e-commerce. Um, one, I mean, although one thing that does come to mind is a lot of, a lot of people that start e-commerce brands want to sell that brand. So, you know, yeah. listen to what we just talked about. Right. But, uh, yeah. So for yeah, e-commerce, yeah, definitely if, if someone is, if someone is like thinking of what they are doing as planting a tree that they're going to cut down, then, uh, you know, using a non-US corporation to hold it might not, might not be the best thing um, unless they have a non-US partner and they want to like leave everything in, um in the company, you know, so, mm -hmm. um, uh, so, um, but, uh, but yeah, other things lots like an agency that has multiple people who run it or like, uh, uh, you know, selling online courses or like, um, life coaches or, you know, there are lots and lots of other types of things that people do that, uh, that work great for, for this sort of structure. What about real estate? As in not just a, U.S. real estate. Mm, if, mm. Well, if if if, the, if if what you mean is buying and selling U.S. real estate, then doing that through a non-U.S. corporation is just a way to pay more tax, uh, because mm. the non-U.S. corporation would actually be subject to U.S. tax itself. And there's this little nasty thing called the branch profits tax, which makes a non-U.S. corporation pay more U.S. tax in this situation than an individual does. So, so that yeah, no. Uh, but I mean, if but it's if it's non-U.S. real estate. Yeah. Yeah. Then definitely you could, yeah, you could definitely use a non-U.S. corporation, but then this gets into issues of if you're using foreign real estate or if you're, if you're buying and selling non-U.S. real estate, you're probably gonna have to pay income tax where that real estate is, you know, uh, depending on, obviously this depends on the law of wherever this, wherever the other place is, but in general countries, you know, if you're making money by literally selling their soil, they kind of want to cut of that usually. And so, uh, and so, so in general, like saving U.S. tax, you know, may not be something that you're all that concerned about because you got to pay a bunch of tax somewhere else. And so, so instead, you're going to want to structure to use something called the foreign tax credit to make sure that you're not taxed twice. So you want to be able to reduce your U.S. income tax by the amount of the non-U.S. income tax you pay. So that's a little bit of a different uh, structuring yeah. concern. Yeah. So that way you only pay tax in one country and not two hmm. yeah ex yeah exactly tax credit beautiful well usually i'll uh end this by asking my guest what uh if any books they might recommend to my listeners uh so if there's just one or three or you know if you love reading five uh, mm. <laughs> that you might think of and and don't feel pressured to make it tax related right um so or yeah however you'd like to do that yeah, the Internal Revenue Code is a great read. Uh, Title twenty six of the United States Code. No, I'm joking. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't know, man. I like a lot of stuff. Uh, there's one book that I've read uh, probably at least like six or seven times in my life, and I, I've, it's it's been a couple of years since I read it. So I, I, 
I was thinking about picking it up again, but it's it's called Papillon by uh, by uh, Henri Charrier. He's like this French guy who got wrongfully sentenced. Uh, it's the, the there's a movie based on it. I think the book's way 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 say. better than the movie, but but anyway, so a uh, French guy gets wrongfully sentenced, gets sent to French Guiana, and then uh, adventure ensues basically. But anyway, it's just a freaking cool book. And like, it's, um, if you're into like travel and adventure, it's, it's kind of like, uh, a way to like live vicariously through someone going through some horrible stuff. But, but, uh, but anyway, I like, uh, it's like my favorite work of fiction, I think. And so if, if, you know, if you, if you haven't ever checked that out, then uh, I'd recommend it. I love it. Yeah. I've actually seen the movie and it's, so very, I mean, I haven't read the book, but the movie's great. So maybe I'll, I'll add yeah. that to my list. And I, I love it because usually I get answers of self-help and things like that. So it's nice to have a little change of pace. But yeah, uh, yeah. but yeah thanks so much again for joining me. Uh, it was educational. And um, yeah, thank you so much. Appreciate your time. Yeah, well, thanks for having me. Good talking with you.